Aeneas is telling the story of the fall of Troy to Dido, his host, while he's in Carthage. In the beginning, the Trojans discover a huge wooden horse on the shore, but the Greeks have apparently gone. They wonder what its purpose is when Laocoon bursts onto the scene from the heights of Carthage, and that's where we begin. The primus here describes Laocoon in the next line, with magna cometante cateroa being an ablative absolute. Laocoon is also artanes, and uh, summa modifies arche. Even before he reaches the Trojans gathered around the horse, he begins shouting. That's the stress of the procul. Laocoon hammers the Trojans with questions. Miseri modifies the key ways, and the question here, quae tanta insania, demands an understood est. What is this so great insanity? We'd probably call it stupidity, though. The fact that the Trojans are completely oblivious to what Laocoon sees clearly. This next question hits on the idea that the Greeks, the hostes here, are mistakenly gone. Assume an essay to make this an indirect statement. Laocoon has two more questions, too. This one has another indirect statement with the infinitive carere, uh, takes in an ablative of separation, lacks deceit. And danaum is genitive plural. There's more on the alliteration in this line at the end of the video. An est can be assumed in this one. Ulixes is the Roman name for Odysseus. And don't get confused by this. We often refer to him in English by Ulysses. And James Joyce named his book Ulysses, which was loosely based on the Odyssey. This Roman version of the name hints at the fact that there were actually several different Greek versions of Odysseus, where the D sound is replaced by the L sound. Oluseus in several different forms and Oluteus in two forms. I'll refer to him with his Roman form, Ulysses, uh, because we're reading a Roman epic, but if you know him better as Odysseus or Oduseus, well, I think you can manage. Ulysses is famous for being cunning and crafty, almost too much so, and while we might have a good opinion of him because of the Odyssey, he's not universally respected in the ancient world. And in fact, Virgil presents a pretty negative view of Ulysses. It's his craft and deceit that Laocoon is hinting at here. The next four lines contain an either or or, three options for what Laocoon thinks could be the reason for the horse. Inclusi modifies a kiwi, and ligno is an ablative of location here. We have a synchesis in the next option. Hike modifies machina and nostros muros. Fabricata est is a perfect passive verb. The future active participles in the next line modify machina, uh, going to peer down and going to come. The order of these two participles is reversed because of a part of speech known as hysteron proteron, literally the second one first, kind of like putting on your shoes and socks, but not in that order, or thunder and lightning. The ventura has to come before the inspectura. Uh, the horse must arrive at the walls first before it can peer into it. With the histron proteron, we should consider the first bit as being more important. Uh, Laocoon is mostly concerned about the possibility of the horse being used to spy into the city. We could also gather that perhaps the uh, inversion of the order of these two actions is meant to show the haste and confusion of our speaker here. He can't even think straight, so he's frenzied. And urbi is a dative used in place of ad urbem uh, to the city, kind of like a dative of place to which. Yeah, that's a thing in poetry. Sorry. This final out here throws everything else unmentioned into the mix. Aliquis modifies error. Uh, now some famous lines. Equo ne credite. Uh, the ne introduces a negative imperative, and credo takes its object in the dative case, so here the equo. Temeo danao sedona ferentes, uh, the popular line in this section. I fear the Greeks even, and that's how we should translate et, kind of like a shortened etiam, bringing gifts or offerings to the gods. In this case, the horse is an offering to Minerva. Sic fatus are our closing quotation marks, and this line concludes with a synchesis, as Laocoon backs up his words with action. The main verb is contorset, a few lines below. Validis viribus, which means strength here, is an ablative of means. In the next line, we have two prepositional phrases with in plus the accusative, meaning into, showing motion towards. The alwum 
is the belly of the beast, feri, referring to the wooden horse. And compagabus, an ablative of means, should be translated predicatively, that is, after the kurwam. And kurwam technically modifies the alwum, the curved belly. But there's a sense of a transferred epithet here. It's the joints, the compagabus, that are curved. The illa refers to the hosta, the spear. Utero recuso is an ablative absolute, and this, by the way, is the first time recutio is seen in Latin, with insonuere and dedere both being syncopated forms for the third person plural perfect tense. Their subject is the kawai kawernai, and gemetum is the object of dedere. These last three lines provide a bit of narrative commentary by Aeneas. Deum is a syncopated genitive plural for deorum, and laiwa has to describe both the fates of the gods and their mains, their minds. With the fates, laiwa should be something like unfavorable, while mains something like foolish. Fuiset is a pluperfect subjunctive, because we're operating in a, a past contrary to fact condition. But, however, the conclusion has impulerat, a pluperfect indicative. So this is to show vividness of the action. The subject is laokoan. He would have forced, with an understood nos as its object, he would have forced us. And then we move to the infinitive foidare, and ferro is an ablative of means. At last, Aeneas turns his story to address Troy. This word is vocative, as is the arx alta, Priam's high citadel. And stares and maneres are second-person imperfect subjunctive verbs. Had the pluperfect verbs been done, then these imperfect verbs would now be the case. It's kind of like a, a present contrary to fact condition appended on to the past contrary to fact one. Addressing something that isn't there is called apostrophe, and Virgil, well, Aeneas, uses it here to increase the emotional pathos, the pity we feel for his lost homeland. Okay, so Laocoon almost ruins the whole Greek trick of the Trojan horse. The big question that follows this is, will the Trojans heed his warnings? I want to point out some pretty cool things that Virgil does in book two that we see here. The first is awesome wordplay. So look at line 44. Dona carere doli sanaum. The alliteration sounds cool, but there's more here. Some suggest that Virgil uses donum and dolus, gift and trick, in the same way to emphasize the fact that the gift of the horse is a trick. He also uses the term danai for the Greeks much more frequently in book two than any other book. And this could be also a reference to donum, the similar sounds, the assonance, alliteration, and consonants at the start of these words joins the Greeks to their gift horse. And we have the similar connection in line 49 and in line 36 before this, and even line 7 if we go beyond words and look at just sounds. And this also shows up in line 252. It's too common to not be intentional. The Greeks are connected to their gift and to their trick. One other thing, several scholars have suggested that Laokoan, even though he's Ardain's eager, fiery in spirit, has a very rational argument about not trusting the horse. He could be representing Roman virtue, and this would contrast him with Sinon, who comes later as the Greek sophist who uses words for evil purposes. He could also be arguing for rational thought over religion, so bringing the horse inside the city doesn't make rational sense, but it does make religious sense. So Virgil would be referencing Lucretius in his Epicurean work De Rerum Natura on the nature of things. And Virgil was educated in Epicurean philosophy, and he definitely knew of Lucretius's work. Next, an unknown man arrives on the scene. Who is he, and what will he tell the Trojans about the horse? <laughs>